Hello, I'm Lynn Hunsaker with Clear Action Continuum. Thanks for joining me today. And we're talking about, is journey mapping necessary? And this is relating to customer, employee, and partner experience journey maps. You know, I've been in this field for a long time and I led company-wide customer experience in two companies. Uh, the last one over a 11 year span. And <clears throat> over the years, I've been noticing a lot of trends and a lot of uh, changes in our field, but a lot of uh, kind of consistency that might need to change in our field. For example, after the 2008 uh, economic downturn, that's when customer experience really took off as a phrase and a title in people's uh, job descriptions. But actually customer experience goes back to the, the 1980s, the 1990s in terms of managing it quite similar to the way that we're doing now. For example, I was voice of the customer manager in 1991, uh, leading a company-wide task force in figuring out our uh, VOC relationship uh, surveys and stuff. So, um, you know, the, the big question is, is it, is it sufficient? Uh, I had a boss who told me many things that we're doing are necessary, but insufficient. And so I invite you to take an open mind as we're talking about this today and think about what we really need for our customers, employees, and partners today, and whether the things that we're doing are sufficient. So let's explore this. You know, in uh, experience mapping for customers, partners, or employees, there's a lot of advantages. And uh, those advantages include, uh, I see that my slides are not showing for you. <laughs> so um, let me see what we can do here. Yeah, okay, there we go, just a slight lag. The advantages include that you a picture tells a thousand words and you can highlight the pain points very visually for people. It can really stand out on a page or on a wall. Uh, a journey map for any purpose can be quite effective in telling a story and especially to see the big picture view. What are the, all the aspects of what people are doing, how they feel about it? Uh, what are the uh, front end and back end things associated with it? You can put quite a lot on a page that convey, can convey a tremendous uh, understanding of experiences. But the thing is that um, you know, we would want to create an outside in mindset and uh, having these with high visibility really can be quite effective for that. Getting teams on the same page, especially if you have multiple phases in your journey that you're mapping, uh, people can see how their degree of collaboration is helping or hindering the experience that people are having. And then finally, uh, having experience type uh, top of mind, whether it's customer experience, employee experience, or partner experience, keeping those expectations and realities and gap closure very uh, top of mind for everyone. But on the flip side, the way that we go about doing experience mapping for the most part is quite uh, small in terms of a persona and a part of the journey to keep it manageable. That's the prevailing advice, but how, how long is it going to take you to do the maps for all personas and for all parts of the journey so that you're not uh, sub-optimizing or leaving someone out? Uh, it could take several years for many companies to complete journey mapping. And in fact, you're never really done. So uh, you may have actual full-time jobs departments that are totally dedicated to journey mapping. And then the question for executives is, are we getting full value out of that? The second question is, is, it, is your journey map really it, uh, outside in or is it inside out? And generally people want to uh, get a group together and put post-its on the wall. And when it's not really based on customer verbatims, then it's really inclined to be an inside out map and that is uh, undermining our, our goal. Another point uh, that we need to make sure we're uh, managing for is whether the, the journey map is only showing touch points. Because if you sit back and look at all of your existing customer data and do a root cause analysis of who is responsible for the issues that customers are putting in front of you, 
in so many ways, you may find that at least half of those issues are not touch points. They're actually owned by people who don't touch the customer. And therefore the question uh, remains whether your journey map is very meaningful and motivational and actionable by the non-customer facing groups. And uh, hand in hand with that is whether your journey map has momentum. Did you plan in advance with stakeholder analysis, really uh, planning for ongoing post-workshop, continuing to carry the baton? This is a big gap. And, um, you know, it's something that can probably be guarded against. We can probably make some adjustments in the traditional way of doing journey maps to address all these uh, purple and light blue boxes that I'm bringing up. And finally, uh, <laughs> is there such a narrow view in the journey map by just looking at one persona at a time and one part of the journey such that you're not really having a holistic view? Uh, my way of looking at journey maps actually is to look at your customer comments without any kind of bias. And when you do that, uh, you can look, let the, the data speak for itself and let the patterns bubble up as you're reading, maybe uh, kind of sorting through stuff without bias in terms of remove all your preconceived labels of segments and journey phases and whatever else, and just see how customers are talking about their journey naturally and see how, how uh, the patterns come up in terms of there's a group of customers that are constantly talking about this aspect of the journey, their experience. And there's a group of customers who are really sensitive about that aspect of, the, of their experience. And what you'll find with that is you usually can have two to four overall expectation sets. And that's better than using the traditional marketing segmentation or service segmentation, sales segmentation that uh, has other uh, history to it, why, why they do it that way. Because at the end of the day, having a good experience among your employees or your partners or your customers is simply a matter of having a one-to-one -one ratio between what you're, you're delivering, what they're getting, and what they expected. So if we are to uh, segment our customers and employees and partners based on the expectation sets that naturally pop up in the course of their comments, then we would have uh, an opportunity to do a broad brush journey map for two to four overall personas. And then you can do your segmentation of uh, deep dives based on where you're seeing the biggest ROI. And that's another thing. How well is the journey map driving customer-centric management of your business? Would we have the great resignation if we changed the way that we did our journey mapping for employees? Could we have avoided that if in the past 10 years we'd been doing journey mapping differently? Or if we'd been doing something else besides journey mapping, could the great resignation have been prevented or avoided? Uh, because you know, to me, the great resignation means that we had some failure in our ex employee experience management. Um, obviously, there were a lot of things that we couldn't foresee with the pandemic and, um, and many of the forces at play there. Still, though, uh, I, I, it seems that all of the remote reengineering that was being done to, to uh, handle um, people working away from the office could have been more customer inspired. Uh, I, I think that re-engineering is still happen happening and maybe it may not be customer inspired enough. How about shrinkflation and skimpflation and inflation? Has journey mapping helped prevent that? I would love to see your comments about that. If you have some success stories in using journey maps to uh, dampen or prevent the great resignation uh, to in instill uh, part, customer experience and employee experience in the re-engineering for remote work and to prevent shrinkflation and skimpflation. And now there are a lot of companies who are experiencing austerity um, and maybe CX layoffs, employee experience and partner experience layoffs. 
So uh, the whole idea of experience management, I think, is to uh, have a good experience for your employees, for your partners, for your customers. And the truth of the matter is that we have a lot of pain for employees and customers and partners today. So I do agree that we have made some good strides in experience management, but we need to do a whole lot more. So going into the 2020s, we might need to shift gears a bit. Let's take a closer look. A few years ago, we did a study asking managers in customer experience, what kinds of initiatives have you launched and how successful have they been? And here on the right-hand side, you can see the, the, I'm going to show you the initiatives that were pretty successful. At least 50% or more of those uh, managers said they were successful. And wonderfully, you can see that um, implementing journey ma management was uh, successful by about 75% of the participants. Uh, however, you, when you look at the, uh, the place that it is upward on this, uh, this box, it's in the lower right quadrant, meaning that only about 20, 25% of companies had actually implemented journey management. And among them, about 75% said that that was successful. On the other hand, we have on the left-hand side of this screen, the yellow uh, indicating that at least half of the people said that it was not very successful. And in fact, for journey mapping, only about a third of people said that their journey mapping was successful. So this was quite interesting to me. Why would there be this gap? And I think it tells the story in uh, looking at the rest of the data that we collected. What else are people doing in experience management? So on the green side, we have voice of the customer, uh, customer recovery, assessments, and uh, CCOs. And on the left-hand side, we have um, a little bit harder stuff like customer experience-focused continuous improvement, employee engagement, cross-functional customer experience council, culture assessment, maturity assessment, and in fact, all of those things add together to transition a journey mapping workshop to the right-hand corner, implementing journey management. You have to have a continuous improvement uh, mindset and uh, actionability of your map in order to implement the journey. You have to have employee engagement built into it. You have to have cross-functional collaboration built in and ways to make it a way of life, therefore affecting your culture and the maturity of experience uh, management in your organization. So I think this is quite enlightening. And in fact, if you look at the patterns of the, the things that are in the upper right corner versus the things that are in the upper left corner, you can see that the short cycle, um, kind of business unit specific, only managed by one or two groups, a lot simpler to manage. Those things are being successful. Whereas the things on the left require a longer term uh, focus and energy level to be maintained and coordination and facilitation across a lot of groups. So when you think about that gap and what's happening with your experience management for employees, for customers, and for partners, you might want to increase the skill sets of your experience management people and also increase the customer-centric thinking among your entire workforce on, and all your partners as well to make sure that you can really get an, a stronger ROI on your journey mapping. Now, what's it all about? What actually causes good experience for employees, for partners, or for customers? It's, do you really understand my expectations? And of course, journey maps are a good way to depict expectations. But again, you might want to assess on a scale of one to five, are your journey maps really reflecting the expectations with clarity so that everyone understands the parameters, the consequences of dropping the ball, uh, what, are, what are the customer's reactions when their expectations aren't met? Is that included in your map? Because 
If it is, it would help to motivate people to use your maps or any other experience management data in how the business is run. If we have great touch points, but in fact, uh, the way that we do our staff meetings, our internal uh, performance reviews of organizations and individuals, and on you know all on down the line, I call those things business rituals. Uh, thing the way that you're managing the the organization, if that doesn't fit what you're trying to design with a two B journey map, then you're always going to have a massive gap, and you're always going to have a lot of money left on the table in terms of what you could be generating for your company and for customers and employees and partners. So ultimately, when you have very clear expectations in your journey map or other ways of managing the experience, then it can motivate how the business is run so that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between what people expect and what they see as realities. That's our goal. And our goal is to take that one-to-one -one ratio, which I call a value quotient as well, and uh, make it a lifetime value of profit, cumulative profitability for employee, partner, and customer experience. We're really inspired by this thing that I saw from Temkin Group called the uh, Customer Experience Maturity Model. And uh, if you can see that the bottom three rows there are uh, ignore, explore, and mobilize. In fact, doing a journey map workshop is mobilizing experience management. You're, put, you're getting it rolling, all right? But you've got to take it further to operationalize, to align, and to embed. So those can happen in tandem. You don't take a couple of years to do operationalizing and then a couple of years after that to do aligning and a couple of years after that to do embedding. Those top three actually happen in tandem and they happen according to your commitment to make it happen. I know from personal experience because we committed to make it happen in the first year that I was a voice of the customer manager in 1994 at my second company leading CX and within two years, we were generating hundreds of thousands of hours saved for our customers and for ourselves and hundreds of millions of dollars saved for our customers and ourselves. So what we're really striving toward is almost automatic experience excellence, meaning why should experience management be almost always focused on remedies and uh, preventing churn or turning things around um, that's crazy. We should be more preventive, more proactive, and have a wonderful experience from the get-go as an employee, as a customer, as a partner. And I do believe that's the intent of journey mapping and human-centered design. Yet we need to take it further than the way how we've been doing to date. So consider these six A's toward that almost automatic experience excellence. It's required to, first of all, base what you're doing on what you're asking your customers. And we're so lucky these days that we have a lot of digital data from our customers, and therefore we already have a gold mine of customer comments on hand. I highly recommend that your first technology purchase, if you're just starting out with formal experience management or figuring out what you wanna do for 2023, buy text mining and voice mining technology, maybe even video mining, and use that extensively. Because when you use your customer comments, then you're going to have a truly outside in journey map or truly outside in reports of any types to, to your uh, managers. And secondly, the second A is to help people absorb what you've asked. And what I've found to be the most powerful is not really a picture, although pictures help, but money is the language that managers speak because that's how they are evaluated. Even if you're somebody in uh, legal or HR or safety or <laughs> supplier management or whatever, everybody wants more budget. Everyone would love to have more profit sharing, ability to hire more people, 
uh, ability to, to do more with their budget. And, uh, you know, frankly, when you show them what is the percentage of customers that are happy or employees that are happy or partners that are happy compared to unhappy, and then how much money is represented by those groups, how much it costs to serve them in any aspect of, of the, the relationship. Usually even just one data point about money, telling people this is just the tip of the iceberg, I don't have access or didn't have time to do the full analysis to do a total cost or total revenue, but just from the data that, that here's it's easy at hand, here's what's represented. People will usually say, my word, something's got to be done with this. This can't stand. And that's what you want to be generating. You want to be inspiring people to get out of their comfort zone, get out of business as usual, and make improvements. I believe that's what we're trying to do by showing pictures. But pictures alone are not going to do it. And in fact, you may be able to motivate a lot of engagement even without pictures. I did. Um, so I know that it's possible. Then you need to get people to adopt, like take ownership of the experience that's there. Really with their hearts and minds fully engaged to own that experience. What's at the root of this? We've got to eradicate this and not, never let it happen again. We want to uh, reap this, this money that's going down the drain and recapture that to expand our budgets. So how do you get them to adopt? This is the big mystery in experience management. So we have created a, a learning community that's specifically focused on helping you manage these six A's in a much smarter way than is typically done and specifically for employee, partner, customer experience and marketing uh, so that expectations are set appropriately Ideal customers are, and employees are uh, recruited and acquired, and then the experience is managed uh, with that one-to-one -one ratio. That's what the value exchange is all about, to help you uh, acquire the skills for these six A's. So of course, you've got to get people to apply what you've figured out from all of the asking, absorbing, and adopting. What's the action? What are they going to do to, uh, inject it into the way that we're running our business, in addition to making sure that we're preventing problems from happening in the future and creating wonderful human-centered experiences. And then of course, accountability. In uh, benchmarking studies that I've done, I've, I've done about six uh, over the years, accountability has been one of the main weaknesses in organizations. And so again, the experience value exchange teaches you ways that you can uh, maintain accountability both on an interact interpersonal level as well as uh, an organizational level and how you can also influence accountability for your entire corporate culture. Imagine that. And then the way that you applaud. There's better ways that we can do each of these six A's and all of these six A's are so pertinent and vital for almost automatic experience excellence. And that's what we want. So whether or not you use maps, make sure that you're striving to create experience management annuities, which means whatever you're showing to managers in whatever way, using maps, using graphs, using verbatims, using video clips, whatever you're using, make sure that you're invoking that uh, motivation to make improvements like this. Now you can see uh, from this list, this is real data. It, these are real achievements when I was leading company-wide experience management. And it's just the tip of the iceberg. We did far more than what you see in this list, but we did it all using uh, root cause analysis, using single page strategies, using Pareto analysis, using uh, team uh, recognition and so forth. We didn't do journey mapping at that time. It might have been more, even more effective if we had, but doggone, we made really awesome achievements. And I hope that your company is making achievements like this as well for your employees and for your customers and for your partner's experience 
to really reap a huge, obvious ROI. When you uh, seek for, for changes of this magnitude, what you're doing is you're freeing up perpetual sunk costs, meaning that it used to be people were constantly complaining or churning or uh, spreading negative word of mouth because they had a pebble in their shoe that was unbearable. Now, because we've got to the root cause of it, it's not happening anymore. Therefore, all those costs that we have traditionally had to spend don't happen anymore. All that money is freed up to put into something better. So you can reallocate those freed up funds into higher value opportunities. And you're also freeing up your customer without, or employee or partner without that pebble in their shoe. And that's what's meant by experience management annuities. At the same time, when you're striving toward this, you're going to be thinking about operationalizing, aligning and embedding, and making sure that your journey maps and anything else that you're doing in experience management is driving toward these three areas of experience management maturity in tandem constantly. And finally, if we do this, I think in the future, experience management can be much more influential in preventing any type of thing going in the future, uh, again, about a res great resignation or a remote, uh, any kind of re-engineering that doesn't take the experience into account first and foremost and ongoing uh, with agile uh, in mind. I think we can prevent shrinkflation in the future and have smarter austerity decisions and prevent layoffs of our experience management people. This is my hope. I really care about it so much and I welcome you to learn more about it through the Experience Value Exchange. So you can see there are six competencies that we've researched as necessary for uh, this almost automatic experience excellence uh, goal that I uh, mentioned. And this year, our winner for the CX Team Sport Award is Best Egg with Trish Wethman, uh, Chief Customer Officer there. Uh, so we wanna say congratulations to you and also, everyone who's listening to this, please uh, get ready to, uh, to uh, submit your achievements for next year. You're totally welcome to do that. I, in closing, I want to let you know that we have a new assessment that can help you to see the gaps in your skill set and your maturity according to the type of things that I've been talking about. The six A's as well as that experience, uh, the experience management maturity uh, scale. It's free. It's a spreadsheet. Nobody sees your data but you. So request that uh, using the uh, URL shown there in the right-hand corner. We have a new timing for our classes on Fridays. We have a leadership class uh, for CX, CX, and PX experts. So that's if you're winning awards, you're speaking at conferences, you've been uh, writing books, uh, keynoting, uh, let's see, you've been doing experience management for a long time. You've already gotten certified in the CCXP or FS, FCXP or any of the other things, then this Friday class is perfect for you to pick up the, the, the nuances, the things that I've been mentioning, and so much more. You'll be blown away. Everyone who who's attended it has uh, been fascinated at vice president level all around. And on Thursdays, we now have our class starting about right now. <laughs> Uh, as well as in the evening, 8, 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern time, which allows us to have uh, the same class on Fridays at Sydney uh, and Manila and Hong Kong and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Mumbai, right? So Fridays for the Asian and uh, Thursdays for Europe and Africa and Middle East. So that all works. And finally, I want to tell you about a new class that we're having in person for the first time in three years because of the pandemic. You're welcome to join me here in Phoenix, Arizona, where the temperature will be between 66 to 76 Fahrenheit in uh, January. We have a beautiful facility. You'll totally love it. So please sign up today and reserve your spot for any of these things. Thanks for joining me. We've been talking about experience leadership which is company-wide alignment to expectations of your 
stakeholders you rely upon for growth, customers, employees, and partners. I appreciate you joining me and please uh, comment offline or on the recording. And I'll look forward to uh, continuing the conversation with you. Take care.